Okay, good. All right, so I'll continue the discussion of symmetry fractionalization and uh, want to um, answer one of the questions that I left behind from last week. Uh, last week we we'll talked about uh, topological civil conductor and couple it to a Z2 gauge field. So, uh, and uh, um, the uh, after coupling to the Z2 gauge field, we, the topological order we get is basically Atari code. And we studied how uh, the anions transform under the remaining time reversal symmetry and found that uh, E particle goes to M and uh, the, uh, the F particle is still F particle. And F particle transforms as a chroma doublet, T squared equal to minus 1. And I remember there was a question about whether uh, e goes to m and m goes back to e if there's a, another minus sign. So I thought a little bit about it and I decided that this is not the case. Uh, or it could be the case, but this minus sign doesn't really um, make much sense. So this is because when we talk about fractional symmetry transformation on the anions, what we have in mind is that this is the whole, whole system. And the ground state of the system is invariant under the symmetry. And now what we do is to create a pair of excitations and bring them very far apart. And then, um, and then we can do uh, apply time reversal uh, symmetry and interpret that as local transformations here and here. right? So we effectively decompose a global transformation into local transformations on top of these uh, Anions. And this can be done because um, uh, it's actually explained in Michael's paper. But uh, uh, this can be done basically because on the ground state, away from the excitation, everywhere looks exactly the same as the ground state. So nothing happens. If it was invariant in the ground state, then it's still invariant here. Uh, the only change that happening on the state is around these anions. So you can uh, think about the change in the wave function as effectively within these two big circles. And then we can try to come up with operations applying, applied to these uh, two regions to mimic the transformation of global time reversal symmetry. But the trick of doing that is that um, we can change the definition of the operation here by a minus sign. And we can always do that. We can apply a minus sign here. We can apply a minus sign there. And, it doesn't, and this is like uh, up to uh, up to you whether you want to add this minus sign or not, because globally we don't see the effect of adding a minus sign. There's an e particle here. There's another e particle there. And if you add minus sign to each both of them, then it's the the total operation is still equivalent to whatever global symmetry transformation you did. So this is just saying that for each anion, we can decide whether to change the definition of symmetry transformation by a minus sign or not. Okay. And then back to the case of E map to M and map M back, back, back to E. Then we can change the definition of time reversal symmetry on only, let's say, M by a minus sign. But we don't change the definition on E. And in that case, we can, we can change the whole sign accumulation during the full circle of going from E to M and M back to E. So this is just saying that uh, we shouldn't treat this minus sign too uh, too seriously. It's, it's, uh, it's um, a redundant uh, gauge choice that we can make. But on the other hand, for this f, the t squared equal to minus 1, this minus 1 is a real minus 1. Because um, with this f, it doesn't get mapped to other anions during the process. It's f in the whole process. So if we apply time reversal twice, and if we change each of them by minus sign, and the minus sign will cancel, right? And in the end, and uh, whatever this phase factor remains an invariant up to this gauge transformation, and more importantly, when you get confused about, uh, like wh well, what I always do, I get confused about whether signs are important or not. I just try to think if they have physical consequence, whether they have measurable consequence. It may not be practically measurable, but at least in thought experiment, whether there are measurable consequence. So. If we have t squared equal to minus 1 on a fermion, uh, the direct consequence is that if we create a pair of fermion and pull them apart, then each of them carries um, uh, a chroma doublet. And a chroma doublet is a degeneracy on the time reversal symmetry. So this is saying that if we pull apart two fermions to very distant 
location so that they don't talk to each other, then the ground state degeneracy of the system will be fourfold instead of just a, a single ground state. Okay. Uh, well, I shouldn't say ground state. It's the state with two excitations. But the degeneracy of this state uh, will be fourfold. Okay. Uh, well, on the other hand, this minus sign accumulated by mapping E to M and M back to E, that doesn't really have the, uh, a similar interpretation in terms of degeneracy. All right, so, so this is actually a very complicated case where uh, anion types change uh, under symmetry transformations. And I show you uh, just because this is a very nice example. And I want you to have in mind an example uh, like that where the anions are exchanged. And it comes up from a very um, an, a situation where everyone knows about the topological superconductor by coupling that to the Z2 gauge theory. But on the other hand, from now on, I want to f uh, not talk about situations where anion types get exchanged. Because from, uh, from starting from now, I want to talk in a, a more general framework, try to say what kind of symmetry fractionalization patterns are possible, and which ones are anomalous, which ones are not anomalous. And it turns out the, the mathematical theory is just uh, 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 very complicated for the situation where anion types do get exchanged. So I want to stick with the case where anion types don't get changed. But of course, things can be generalized. Um, I'm not exactly sure whether it has been generalized all the way through. I talked to Parsa, and he said they have been making new progress. So this is still uh, ongoing uh, research. But at least for the case where anions are not exchanged, things are pretty, um, and uh, things are much more clear. And that's what I want to tell you about uh, in the following lectures. Um, but of course, keep this in mind. This is just a, a nice illustration of, um, of what can happen uh, when anions do get exchanged. Okay. Yes? I understand what's confusing about that. If you have this for this Oh, yes, exactly. So, so when that happens, all right, sorry. So the question is, uh, 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 the, the question is, time reversal is uh, not a spatial transformation, right? Time reversal is kind of an internal transformation, but somehow it can exchange E and M, which is actually a very global transformation, right? So the picture I was talking about, that creating excitations, applying global symmetry, and the effective action of the global symmetry is equivalent to acting only in those regions, that works only if the anion type don't change, right? If I act locally, I cannot change one type of anion to another type of anion. But of course, this picture will break down if we have an E particle here. If we have an E particle here. Um, in that case, we will have to actually create a pair of uh, fermions and fuse them with the E. And on top of that, you can talk about local transformations. So rigorously speaking, I should say I'm adding a minus sign to the local part uh, besides the global part where we created two fermions uh, that already changed the, uh, the topological sector. Yeah, sorry. So when anion types are not changed, the effective action is localized near the anions. But when anion types do get changed, first we need to change the anion type. And then on top of that, we do some local transformation. And then that low transformation, you can still uh, change the sign by minus one or not. Uh, OK. All right. So the consistency condition. Um, well, the consistency condition is actually very intuitive. And uh, um, um, if you talk about what kind of charge can the fractional quasi-particle uh, in a new equal one third fractional quantum Hall carry, I don't think anyone can get it wrong. So because each of the quasi particle in the fractional quantum Hall system uh, is like one third of the electron, right? So we have A fused with A fused with A gives you one electron. So we know that the one electron has charge one then each of the quasi particle better have charge uh, one third. So there's 
not many other ways to do it. If you, if each of the quasi particle have charge one fifth, then this wouldn't be consistent. Uh, that's that's just saying that if we have a bunch of anions, and when they fuse, uh, the symmetry representation they carry will be added together. Or uh, in the case of charge, it's added together. In the case of a representation, we say they're tensor product together, and. Uh, the representation carried by their fusion product should be equivalent to uh, the tensor product of the symmetry charge of this bunch of anions. Okay, so this is fractional quantum Hall. Um, I remember we talked about spin charge separation. In that case, we have a spin down, which carries spin one half. And no charge, charge 0. But we also have a charge on, um, which doesn't have spin. It has spin 0 for charge 1. And they fuse together to get the electron, which has spin one half and charge one. Right. So um, it's just that simple. That if you take one anion and another anion, anion A and anion B, and they fuse to anion C, then the representation carried by anion A and anion B should fuse to the representation carried by anion C. Uh, yes, OK. Um, so for in general, for non-abelian case, then um, let's say we have in the Fafian, right? We have a sigma and a sigma. And they fuse into uh, some a plus uh, plus i. And just these are abelian things. This is non-abelian things. And we know that in Fafian, uh, this is like a quarter charge. And this is a quarter charge, and this is uh, 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 charge one half, charge one half. So um, even though there might be multiple fusion channels, uh, they still have to be uh, consistent. But of course, if let's say let's just say in case we, we take a, a spin one half and fuse it with another spin one half, then what we can actually get is a uh, either a spin 0 or a spin 1, right? Both these cases can happen. This is just saying that these fractional symmetry representations are only defined up to the integer ones. So a uh, spin 0 and a spin 1, they differ by a spin 1, which is an integer excitation uh, that can be created by acting on the system in a, in a local region with some unitary transformation. You don't need to actually create anions in order to have that. So whether two spin 1 half anions fuse into spin 0 or spin 1 is totally up to local dynamics. And, uh, and uh, only the fractional part is determined by the topological data. Yeah. OK. Mm. Uh, right. Uh, so this, this looks very simple. but. Uh, but I want to make it um, more systematic. I want to make it more formal. And when I want to try to write things down more formally, I, uh, uh, I run into a little bit of a problem. I remember last week, I, we said that these kind of fractional symmetry representations can be described by a You mean this would be I? Sorry? Uh, <laughs> these don't add. <laughs> and so <laughs> these two, they should add. But these two, they don't add. This is like, <laughs> right, sorry. The anions fuse, but the quantum numbers add. And these two, they're like different s direct sum sectors. Uh, of yeah, composite representations. <laughs> right, good point. Thanks. Um, so remember, last week we talked about uh, these fractional symmetry transformations 
forming, someone mentioned that it forms a projective representation. So uh, there are matrices corresponding to group elements such that you multiply them together. Uh, we get some phase factor in front, right? And uh, for the one third charge, this is uh, if we do a uh, if we do a pi rotation, pi rotation, and do nothing here, this is e to the i two pi over three um, for individual quasi particles in a fractional quantum pot. Okay, so. It feels like that we can use this, uh, this omegas to describe uh, the fractional representation carried by the anion. We can have omega of particle A, and we can have omega of particle B. And when A and B fuse, they should give rise to omega of particle C. Right? So this, this is intuitive, intuitively very true. So it's basically. Saying what, saying what we see here, that anions fuse and their fractional quantum representation, fractional symmetry representations uh, have a tensile product structure. Uh, but on the other hand, to make this uh, very rigorous statement, I want to bring up another feature, actually also for later discussion. And I think uh, that's a very nice way to think about all these kind of things. So let's try to imagine uh, what happens. So we have, uh, let's say, these one third charge. OK. Uh, and what we can do is to bring it around some symmetry flux. There's a symmetry flux. This is magnetic field flux of pi. OK. Um, and we bring a particle around pi, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, 2 pi. We bring a quasi particle around 2 pi because this carries a charge of 1 third, right? So the phase factor accumulated is e to the i. 2 pi over 3. This is exactly the phase factor that I wrote there. It's uh, purely because this one has one third charge. But on the other hand, there's another thing that we can bring this A particle around and get a phase factor of e to the i 2 pi over 3. That's just the anion itself. right? So we know that these A anions, their topological spin is e to the i pi over 3, because they're one third of, char uh, one -third of electron. So when you do a full braiding like that, this gives rise to the phase factor also of e to the i 2 pi over 3. OK. And this is, this is true not just for one anion. We can bring two anions, right? We take two anions, go around uh, uh, two pi flux, and it accumulates twice this phase factor. And similarly, if we do the braiding around an A quasi particle, it also accumulates two, two times the phase factor. So this just gives us an equivalence of two pi flux with these anions. OK. So if we write it, in terms of fusion um, of symmetry flux. So if we think of the two pi flux as composed of a pi flux and times a pi flux, that's just saying that a pi flux and time flux, uh, time pi flux multiplied together is equal to this A particle with no flux at all. So this relation, instead of having a phase factor in front like above, we have an anion as the coefficient. Right? So this is the fusion of symmetry flux up to some 
anion uh, in the theory. And this relation applies to all quasi-particles in the theory. This is saying that if we bring the quasi-particle around a pi flux, around another pi flux, it's equivalent to bring the quasi-particle around nothing up to this full braiding of the quasi-particle with this A. Okay. So in, in one equation, we captured the fractional symmetry representation carried by all quasi-particles. So we don't need to write omega A, omega B, omega C individually. Instead, we just write how the symmetry flux fuse with each other. Yes? Uh, okay, yes, good, good question. So, okay, so when we talk about uh, U1 symmetry, um, U1 symmetry is parameterized by 0 to 2 pi, and 2 pi is equivalent to 0. But we often talk about uh, 2 pi flux um, because if we think about non compact uh, gauge field, it, it does make sense. But of course, as a gauge flux, 2 pi flux should be the same as zero flux. So I, when I write things like that, I'm a little bit being a little bit vague. But if I want to make it really concrete, I better write it as phi zero, but with uh, an A in front. And uh, so I don't want to write phi two pi because um, it should be equal to phi zero, but instead I write phi pi times phi pi, which are much more better well-defined. Yes, exactly. As long as the flux on this side add up to 2 pi, then there's an A here. Yes, and then this is just my arbitrary choice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, that's the point. OK, I'll talk about that in a while. Oh, for, for the fractional quantum hall, we don't reduce to Z2. The U1 is the full symmetry. The, um, yeah. Integer charge are really well defined for fractional quantum hall. It's not superconductor or anything. So, yeah. Uh, well, even though I write pi, I could just write theta and 2 pi minus theta. So it does work for everything. Okay. It's just there's a discontinuity whenever you get to 2 pi. And, uh, and there's this extra. Uh, factor in front. Okay. Uh, right, okay. So in general, we should write the relation as symmetry flux of group element G1 times the symmetry flux of group element G2 is equal to symmetry flux of group element G1 times G2 up to some anion. Let me use A. I'll use A, G1, G2, and A. A is uh, in the set of a billion anions. in the theory. Of course, we will have a, a billion topological order, then it's set of all annuals in the theory. Okay. Yes? Huh? Uh, yes. yes. A billion annuals fuse with a billion annuals gives you a billion annuals. Yes. yes, Dominic? Uh, right, I'll talk about that in a while. OK. And did you have a question? You mentioned symmetry in the previous lecture. Sorry, what did you say? I didn't understand. So your Meyer on a uh -huh. went up and down. Uh huh. Um, symmetry flux. Uh huh. Model whose gauge for EMF. 
uh -huh. charge. So at least uh -huh. I'm supposed to think of it. Yes, exactly. So um, you're looking at the ungauged model, making the fusion have flux on symmetry yes. flux. Yes. That's my next step. Um, going to answer both your questions in a little bit. Uh, okay. Any more questions? No. Okay. Let me. Uh, okay. So. So let me do a few examples before I move ahead. So. Um, let's say I have time reversal symmetry. I have time reversal symmetry. Of course, time reversal symmetry satisfies globally doing twice equal to identity. This is the group structure, right? So it's a basically a Z2 group. Of course, you need to keep in mind that it's some kind of anti unitary transformation. Um, and we apply it to the Tori code. OK? And, uh, and then I ask about what are the possibly consistent symmetry fractionalization pattern. And all you need to do is to look at relations like this and see what kind of coefficient we can come up with and interpret that as the symmetry fractionalization pattern on the annuals. OK? So well, for, uh, for time reversal symmetry, there's only one non-trivial group element. So we just, uh, so this relation becomes non-trivial only when we have g1 and g2 both being Time reversal, right? Uh, I know. <laughs> um, that's a good point. Um, in general, I don't want to talk about symmetry flux for time reversal symmetry, but um, sometimes things do work. I can't guarantee that it always works, but at least in this case, it does work. Um, hmm? Mm. Okay, let me talk about Z2. <laughs> uh, so the, the answer to your question is, um, for unitary symmetry, we can be very clear how this works. For anti-unitary symmetry, it's not very straightforward to see how to talk about symmetry flux in that context. Uh, there may be a way, but it's, uh, it, it's not uh, like um, very well understood. Um, but a lot of this formalism, in the end, does apply to time reversal symmetry. Yeah, I wanted to talk about this example because um, then we can see anomaly coming from here. Um, if I talk about Z2, that, uh, that one doesn't have anomaly. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so just um, tolerate me for, for this example that I'm talking about symmetry flux for time reversal. It's just this, this way of describing symmetry fractionalization, it does work. I can't guarantee that it works in general for time reversal, but um, yeah, in this case, it's fine. No problem. Is the, uh, sorry. Yeah, in this case, uh, this is, you can think of it as real magnetic field going through the sample and, uh, and, and accumulates this phase factor. Uh, this is not a, this is not angle, <laughs> this is braiding statistic. Hi. Um, on well, if I don't make a full braiding, I don't think I can talk about phase factor. If I do an exchange, I can talk about the phase factor of e to the i pi over 3 if they are the same quasi particle. But for topological process, you need to bring the particle back to its original position. You can't just do halfway and talk about phase factors because that's not, not the original configuration. And you can't, can't compare them. So only, in, only when we do a full circle, uh, we, we can talk about phase factors. Uh, from the quasi-particle braiding statistics. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes, 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 exactly. Right. Remember that uh, Michael was talking about E and M particles braiding around each other, and then 
actually need to divide by the process where there's no A particle here and uh, this one still goes around and all that. So th that is the phase back I'm talking about, the topological part of the braiding process. Okay, uh, good. Uh, right, so, so I can talk about unitary Z2 here or I can talk about time reversal even though time reversal flux is a little bit tricky. Okay, so the thing we want to figure out is, um, let's say phi t, phi t. Don't ask me what phi t means, but uh, let's just write down this equation. So there's something in front, and there's something in front well, we have four choices, right? We have identity, we have E, we have M, and we have F. So all of them are possible. I didn't talk about Y yet, but let's just say everyone is possible. And what would they mean? If this is I, that's a pretty trivial one, right? It's just saying that uh, time reversal doing twice is equivalent to doing nothing. So there's no symmetry fractionalization on any of the quasi particles. But if this is E, then that's saying that doing time reversal twice to the E particle, if this is an E particle, doing time reversal twice is equivalent to bringing an E particle around, which is plus one. But however, if we do it to the other two, if we do it to M or F, this is also equivalent to bringing an E particle around. And uh, this gives us two, a minus one. So this is saying that time reversal twice on M and F is minus one. So M and F are chroma doublets. P squared equal to minus one. So if we create a pair of them and bring them apart, they will, have, they will gener generate for full degeneracy on the time reversal symmetry. Similarly, if we have M here, then for M transforms as T squared equal to one, and E and F transforms as T squared equal to minus one. Let me, let me finish this sentence. And if we have F here, then uh, for F, it's T squared equal to plus one, and E and M being minus one. I want to make sure I say all three cases. Okay, go ahead. Oh, right, yes, there's a comma. Um, or uh, F, yes, either. Okay. So um, just by uh, looking at it, these four symmetry fractionalization patterns all look pretty consistent, right? Um, if we have the E particle transforming as T squared equal to plus one, and these two as minus one, it's consistent because if you fuse an E with an M, you get an F, and that's uh, a minus one, and if you fuse M and F together, you get a plus one, which is back to the E particle, right? So by writing the, uh, the symmetry fractionalization pattern in this fashion, we already guarantee that the consistency condition is satisfied. Um, okay. so, so in general, if we want to solve for uh, relations like this, if we have a more complicated group and uh, we want to know what kind of coefficient we can put here, then we need some, uh, we need some equations. And those equations come from uh, the associativity of fusing symmetry fluxes. If we fuse these two first, or we fuse the next two first, they should be equivalent so if you have worked with uh, like um, uh, uh, projective representations, this is the kind of thing that comes up, that uh, these kind of projective coefficient should satisfy the consistency condition of this associativity condition 
when you multiply three things together. And that gets translated into the relation of uh, So if we combine these two first, we get this coefficient. And then we combine the composite, which is the flux for G1, G2 with G3, we get this, this anion. And we do the same thing on the other side. We first combine G2, G3, we get A of G2, G3. And then we combine the composite of G2, G3 with G1, we get an extra one. So the composite of uh, the, the combination in this way, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, they should be equivalent to each other. So if we solve this equation, we'll be able to see that all these four are possible solutions of this equation. Yes. Yes. So in this case, we study the Sorry? What did in you say? we with the, the superconductor. Uh, the right, right, right. Yes, uh, I uh, I said I want to forget about the situation. Yeah, but uh, if you um, take it take that into account, then what you need to do is to write a G one here, meaning that G one will act on this uh, first component either by mapping E to M or M to E or F as itself. Uh, okay, so you're yes. Just yes. Yes. I I want to stick to that case for now. Hmm. Yeah, that uh, because my yeah, as I go to the anomaly stuff, then a lot of things won't apply to the case where I know get switched. So, yeah. Um, right. Okay. Okay. Um. So. Oh. Um. So we can solve this equation and get all these solutions. Like in this case, there are four solutions. But there could be case where the solutions are actually uh, equivalent to each other. Um, in order to talk about that, I want to go back to explaining. I want to, I want to go back and then talk more about how to think about symmetry fluxes and how to think about uh, braiding of them, fusion of them, um, and what's their relation with symmetry action locally. Okay. So, so remember last week uh, we talked about the relation between gauge flux and symmetry flux, right? I, I mentioned that a gauge flux is some sort of descendant of symmetry flux once you gauge it. And the way to see that is to do gauge fixing. And we put, we imagine that we start from a gauge field configuration where everywhere is zero. And uh, we make a, make a flux here and a flux there. And, uh, and then on the static gauge field configuration, what we can do is to add some non-zero gauge field along the links between these uh, branch cuts, right? and then translate it into uh, the change of the original Hamiltonian is the, the corresponding change is that we can take Hamiltonian terms that across that crosses this branch cut and take these term out and conjugate them on half of on, on one side of the branch cut by the symmetry transformation. Okay. So this is what symmetry flux do. You can imagine even though these two Crosses. So uh, okay. So things near the cross are actually not well defined. For example, we can we can take terms that look like that, these three body terms, and it's a bit hard to say which part is on which side and how would you like to conjugate it. Especially, for example, if we have four body terms like that enclosing this this plaquette, um, it's not well defined. But for things really in the middle of this branch cut. It is well defined. We take uh, local interaction terms out and conjugate half of them. So 
even though things are not really well defined near the flux point. Um, but the thing that matters is that we can imagine creating these flux points and uh, take them apart and generating this branch cut along its way. Okay. And what's important is what happens along its way. What happens along its way is that the Hamiltonian term gets conjugated and like that. So if we take a 2D system and uh, generate a pair of fluxes and then take them around the circle and finally annihilating them. We can imagine doing this process. And what it means is, of course, just to conjugate the Hamiltonian t term by term along this path um, and eventually forming a full circle. But if we are, but this, this picture of ha creating symmetry flux and taking them apart just allows us to think of them in, in a similar way as quasi-particles. Right, we can create them in pairs, take them apart, and eventually annihilate them. And of course, after this process, if this is an anion, then after this process, pretty pretty much nothing happens. We can get a phase factor or something, depending on what's in the middle. But if this is symmetry flux, then we create a pair, take them apart, and uh, braid them around. Then after this process, all the Hamiltonian terms across this circle will get conjugated. Right? And that's equivalent to applying symmetry just inside the circle. Is that obvious why? So what does applying symmetry inside the circle do? Applying symmetry inside the circle, let's say this is the unitary operation inside region A for symmetry G. Okay. Applying symmetry inside this circle means that we take every term inside the circle and also on the boundary and conjugate with the symmetry transformation. Right. We take Hamiltonian terms and do that. Uh, but of course, if the term is purely here, if we take term here, it doesn't change because this is a symmetric Hamiltonian. So it's supposed to remain invariant under global symmetry transformation. But of course, this term doesn't know whether you're doing symmetry globally or just in this region, because as long as it, that, that term can tell, it's a pretty big symmetry. So it remains invariant. The only difference from a global symmetry happens to the terms on the boundary. The boundary term can really tell that you, you're only doing symmetry on one side of the boundary, but not the outside. Right? So for the boundary term, what happens to them is that they get conjugated by symmetry on one side but not the other side. And uh, if we take a term that's totally outside of this circle, of course, nothing happens to it. So the terms that get changed are these, uh, these boundary terms. And that's exactly what symmetry flux does. Symmetry flux, um, we, we generate them, and they, they conjugate the term along the branch cut by symmetry on only half of the term. Uh, yes. Um, um, so for, um, for lattice symmetry, uh, like translation symmetry, we can also talk about defects like these, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, somehow I lost that word. Uh, why I lost, lost that? Uh, yeah, dislocation, yes. Uh, and for rotation symmetry, we can have disclination. And you can imagine that bringing a dislocation around, and that also applies translation to a region in, in, in a certain sense. Yeah. So this picture also applies, even though I don't want to talk about um, uh, uh, translation, uh, spatial symmetry too much. All right, so, so what I'm trying to convey is just this picture. Uh, it's, it's one conclusion. Let me try to write it down. It's more or less intuitive conclusion, but um, it's a very important one. So let me write it down. Uh, braiding symmetry flux. A 
wrong a region. So that means we create a pair, um, stretch them apart, and then finally annihilate them, this whole process. This is equivalent to applying symmetry locally. Sorry, what did you say? If you apply the uh, computation outside the circle, then it would be equivalent to applying the symmetry non local. If I apply the symmetry outside the circle. Because you, oh, you yeah. chose the convention that applies the conjugation within the circle. Oh, okay. So here, I shouldn't say locally. I should say to this region. It doesn't matter whether it's a finite region or not. I'm just dividing the whole system into two parts one is inside, one is outside. Right, so the picture I have is that um, instead of thinking the line, I want to think of the endpoints of the line, which are symmetry fluxes, these crosses. And I, I generate the circle by creating two crosses, the symmetry fluxes, and the take them apart and then finally annihilate them. So that's like braiding a quasi particle around the region. When we, when we braid E and M, we, we generate a pair, we um, bring them around and finally annihilate them. So it's, uh, it's uh, just using similar, uh, <coughs> similar terminology as braiding quasi-particles, even though this is a totally different process. But on the other hand, upon gauging, it becomes the braiding of symmetry flux, uh, gauge flux, sorry. Uh, sorry, you're talking about exchange. So exchange is um, two things, and you exchange their position. Uh, when I say braiding, I usually mean that there's something in the middle, and then I take, I'll create a pair here and uh, bring one around and finally uh, annihilate the pair. Yeah. So there can be something in the middle or not. But the thing is, I'll create a pair here and then bring it around. So this is the picture that I want you to have when think about symmetry flux braiding of symmetry flux and how it becomes, how it can be translated into braiding of gauge flux and the fusion of gauge flux. And, uh, and, uh, and in the end, become some data of the gauge theory. I, I see uh, many confused faces, more confused faces than last week. Yes. Can you explain the logic and why when t squared goes Oh, OK. Right, OK. So back to here, OK. So let's just talk about a quasi-particle in fractional quantum Hall. Quasi-particle in fractional quantum Hall, uh, do two pi rotation is equivalent to doing nothing up to this phase factor. And then I translate it into the fact that uh, symmetry flux fuse up to an anion. Right? And if we want to go backward, if we already have this relation, we want to ask how does quasi-particles transform under the symmetry? Then what we do is to take this anion, braid it around the, ad the, the anion you care about, and that will give you the phase factor. So if we care about, uh, let's say, the A, A quasi-particle, how does it transform under charge conservation? We take the A that we care about, and braid it around this coefficient, which of course the same a, and that gives you e to the i, two pi over three. If I care about how two quasi particles transform, I take two quasi particles, braid it around this a, and uh, and that will give me of course twice the the phase factor. Okay. And similarly here, 
what the relation I have is in terms of the fusion of the symmetry fluxes. And if I want to back off from this point to deduce how the quasi-particles transform, I just take the coefficient, braid it around the anion that I care about, and that will give me a plus or minus 1. Okay, so if the coefficient is e, then I braid it around e, it gives me 1. It gives, if I braid it around m and f, it gives me minus 1. And this is just saying doing time reversal twice is minus 1 on uh, either m or f. And that's, a, that's, that's what happens for a karma doublet. Right, so um, you probably heard about this, um, maybe not, that uh, uh, braiding symmetry flux is equivalent to doing symmetry locally, maybe. And this is what people say, um, but, but this is how I understand it, that actually um, what, you, what actually happened is the Hamiltonian terms gets conjugated and if you complete the circle, then the conjugation is equivalent to applying symmetry in this region. Of course, you can apply the inverse symmetry on the outside of the system, uh, on the outside of this region. And that's just uh, the same thing. Um, yes. Sorry. Um, okay, so okay, so this this thing I talk about is braiding symmetry flux. So symmetry flux is literally changing the Hamiltonian along a branch cut. Okay, and uh, I talk about even though this this is not an anion, this is literally changing Hamiltonian. So it's not deconfined anion. This is like if you think physically, this is like inserting a pi flux in a p plus in, in a superconductor or something. So it's literally changing the Hamiltonian. And it costs expensive energy along this path because the Hamiltonian is changed, the ground state is changed along this path. So these are not anions. But uh, once I gauge it, I, I couple it to dynamical gauge field. If the gauge field is uh, deconfined, when the gauge flux and gauge charge are deconfined, then the symmetry of flux translates into gauge flux. And in that case, the gauge flux are deconfined. And uh, yes, did I answer your question? Let me make sure I answered. I already talked about it. <laughs> so, so last week, I talked about how to couple a sim model with symmetry to dynamical gauge field. And we have symmetry flux, right? And uh, and I also talk about why gauge flux corresponds to symmetry flux by through this uh, gauge fixing procedure. We first put all the gauge field to be zero, and then we make flux by, by putting some non-trivial configurations here. And that translates into conjugation of Hamiltonian along the symmetry branch cut. So right, I already talked about it. <laughs> so, this is that, that's my attempt to show you that symmetry flux is related to gauge flux. And the braiding of them, uh, even though they're totally different objects, this is confined excitation. Uh, this is confined, and gauge flux are deconfined. But a lot of their properties are similar to each other. And we can, um, if, I, if we figure out things on the symmetry flux side, we can use them to understand the property of the gauge flux. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The phase. Oh, uh. You, you take a pi flux? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, exactly. So this, the picture you're talking about is that uh, 
So you have a superconductor, and there's a, a H, H over two e, H over two e uh, vortex. Okay, and um, and usually if we want the H over two e vortex in a system, then there's a branch cut that gets connected to the boundary, right? What, because what we do is to take all the hopping and pairing terms along this branch cut and um, add a minus sign. So if there's a C dagger C or C dagger C dagger term, we add a minus sign in front along this branch cut. Okay, and after we do that, we say there's a pi, there's a H over two E flux here. This is a flux. Okay, and and then we can imagine like uh, Leon suggested, we imagine dragging this thing around the region and let it go back to its original position. So in that process, this branch cut follows. Uh, this uh, h over 2e flux and uh, also trace out the circle and uh, and in the end it forms a complete circle right so um, so after this process and we have taken all the uh, hopping and pairing terms across this circle and added a minus sign on top of it right so that's just um, taking taking all the fermions in this region and add a minus sign to it so, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, thanks for this picture. Yes, yes, exactly. Huh? Oh, yeah, so here the other one is uh, like on the boundary. Uh, or I can imagine that uh, I, I don't do this, but uh, I create a pair here and then extend them and then finally annihilate them. Uh, if I want to cancel uh, cancel a branch cut, yes, then I want to do yeah. something like that. Yes. Um, right. Thanks. So it helps to think about superconductor. So what's what is the result of that process? You get uh, you take all the uh, the fermions inside the region and multiply them by minus one. Yeah. If you have. Um, Cooper pairs that cross this boundary, then it gets a minus sign. Okay, right. Uh, okay, so so this is uh, this is uh, so symmetry flux. Braiding a symmetry flux around the region is equivalent to applying symmetry to that region. This is the the picture I want you to um, have, and then. And then we can talk about fusion of symmetry flux. So let's imagine we have a system. And we can apply symmetry G1 to a region, right? And then we can apply symmetry G2 to a region. Uh, I, I didn't draw them exactly on top of each other, but uh, this is just saying that one is first, one is second, but you should in imagine that they're just on top of each other. And this is equivalent to, this usually is equivalent to applying symmetry G1, G2. To the region, right? This is normal. This is just like saying uh, symmetry in this region uh, still has this group structure that you apply G1 and you apply G2, and uh, and it's equivalent to applying uh, G1, G2. Um, but on the other hand, if we think of this process as um, as braiding symmetry flux instead of applying symmetry, then these two are not quite equivalent. These two are equivalent up to the braiding of an anion. Braiding of this anion A, G1, G2, around this region. 
So if this is ground state, then braiding this anion doesn't do anything. But if there's another anion here, then, it, then there, is a, there will be a phase factor. So, Uh, I shouldn't, yeah. I should draw this also here. So this is on the same system, and actually on top of each other, even though I draw them separately. So this is A, G1, G2. And this is exactly the, the thing I was talking about here. Uh, I'm back and forth a little bit. But uh, here I draw the quasi-particle going around the flux. But it's equivalent to just think of the flux going around uh, the quasi-particle. Um, so this is just saying that if I take a flux and braid it around this quasi-particle, it gives me the same phase factor. But if I take two different flux going around the region, it's equivalent to get the, the composite flux and bring around the region up to braiding of this quasi-particle. So this is exactly the picture that I draw here. that I take a symmetry flux, apply it to a region, take another symmetry flux, apply it to a region. It's equivalent to the composite flux around the region up to the braiding uh, of this, uh, this quasi-particle. So, um, so if we have the pi flux of charge conservation and pi flux of charge conservation in the fractional quantum pole, it's equivalent to doing nothing up to braiding of the quasi-particle, the elementary quasi-particle, around this region. And this is true no matter what, what is inside. There can be quasi-particle inside. It, it's not only true for the ground state, it's true for uh, uh, excited states as well, well low energy excited states. Uh, and then the next step is to, yes. So you're talking about applying the symmetry flux to the Hamiltonian, but now, now you're talking about applying the symmetry flux to the state. Yeah, OK. Great. This is a great question. So this is actually the key point. So um, I'm sorry, I should have. Um, I feel that I could have talked about this part in a better way, but it's a little bit back and forth. Um, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate questions that will help me clarify the point. Um, so here, we talk about braiding symmetry flux is equivalent to conjugating the Hamiltonians. And the conjugating Hamiltonians is literally equivalent to applying symmetry in the region, right? Here, we talk about uh, uh, braiding the symmetry flux on the state. But on the state, braiding the symmetry flux is not quite applying symmetry in the region because symmetry in the region still form a group. It doesn't, it doesn't form a group up to something. So if it applies E2 symmetry in an icing uh, system, applying symmetry even though um, in, a, in a region twice, it should be identity. It's not up to something. But of course, if we just talk about symmetry application in a region, like sigma x, sigma x, sigma x, sigma x, that doesn't know anything about the system, about the Hamiltonian, about the ground state. So they just know their group structure. They just know that we flip spin once, and we flip spin back, and it's back to doing nothing. But if we talk about this braiding anions, uh, braiding symmetry flux around the region, that's actually, that actually corresponds to the adiabatic transformation of the ground state under this change of the Hamiltonian. And that will have a lot to do with what kind of ground state we have. 
and whether we have an anion in the middle or not. So this is the change of the Hamiltonian. And as the Hamiltonian change adiabatically, the ground state also change with it. So in the process of creating a symmetry flux, a pair of symmetry flux and pulling them apart, the ground state change along the branch cut. So here, when I draw the, the symmetry flux going around the region, it's actually the ground state changing along this path. So it changes all along the way. And in the end, the symmetry flux uh, annihilate with each other. And the ground state has changed around this, uh, this, ribbon, uh, this, this region. It doesn't change anywhere else. It only changes around this region. And now we apply G2, it changes again. But this change, it's not exactly induced by applying symmetry in this region. Because it doesn't form a group structure. It's induced by some unitary transformation along this circle only. Because symmetry transformation applies to the whole region. Right? But here, this transformation on the ground state, it, it's induced by applying some unitary transformation along this circle. So this unitary transformation, G1, and unitary transformation, G2, they combine into the unitary transformation of G1, G2, up to this braiding operation of this anion. This braiding operation of anion is, of course, another unitary transformation. Um, yeah, so this is what happens for the ground state. This is what this process knows about the topological order in the state. When, while when we talk about symmetry action in a region, that doesn't know about the topological order. And of course, uh, if it doesn't know about the topological order, it's just uh, it just knows about the symmetry group. It's going to composite according to the uh, the group structure. But here. It very much matters what's the topological order here. And then it, it um, determines correspondingly what unitary transformation to apply around the circle. And then when we combine them, this thing shows up. And this thing tells you what kind of topological order we have um, in the ground state. I hope that's better. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So in this case, you can check that this equation is satisfied. Maybe you already said that, but uh, what exactly do you mean by the plot? Um, I, 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 I don't want, <laughs> yeah. <so laughs> Right, so I, I shouldn't be talking about flux of t, but it's just in this case, I want to talk about these patterns because one of them will be anomalous, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's, this, it's just this, this equation works. There's not much I can say, yeah. Right. Sorry. I could, I could have done z2, but in the case of z2, they're all non-anomalous. OK, so, so the next step I want to do is to not draw four circles, but only draw half circles. So this is just by cutting this full circle into half. I just imagine I don't complete the braiding process. I just do the process halfway. Then here, I would have a flux of G2 and the flux of G1. On the other hand, on the other side, I would have flux of G1, G2 oh, G1 multiply with G2 and this annual A. So if you, so, so this is literally the, the fusion picture of anions, right? When we put these two, if we think of them as anions, it's almost saying that fused up, 
fuse of fusing these two ions is equivalent to fusion of these two ions. Because braiding them around the full circle gives you equivalent action. So this is uh, this is this is just trying to explain in picture what I mean here. That fusion of symmetry flux can be up to an anion. In the end, it's saying that applying symmetry locally to the ground state, um, the composition of Different symmetry fluxes uh, of different applying symmetry, different symmetries to a local region is up to braiding the anion around the region. You don't, you don't care whether it's A cross B or B cross A? Uh, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here yeah. it's uh, G1, G2, so it's this order. Right. Oh. Oh, here you <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is the difference between uh, symmetry flux and gauge flux. Uh, that this is not yet deconfined cosy particle. So uh, the fusion, uh, I, I care about the order of the fusion. Um, of course, upon gauging, uh, if they don't commute, then uh, it's non-abelian gauge theory. And in non-abelian gauge theory, the gauge fluxes are not labeled by group elements. They're labeled by conjugacy class so that you take all the conjugations of the uh, group elements and they bundle them into the same class of gauge flux. And that takes care of this uh, non-abelian, uh, non-commutativity of fusion rule. Because in that case, you label the gauge flux by conjugacy class, not group elements anymore. So then you restore the commutativity of, um, of fusion of gauge flux. Yeah, but this is a great point, yeah. So when it's uh, symmetry flux, the fusion is not commutative. Yeah, because the group group elements usually they don't commute. They they may not commute. Right. So. So I talk about all all these all these things, and uh, because I want to make one point that. Um, uh, this relation, this fusion of flux relation, uh, there's a redundancy here. Because when I, when I create two symmetry flux and pull them apart and braid them around the region, this process is um, in together with doing this, I can also take a pair of anions and uh, pull them apart and braid them around the region, right? Because all I need is for all I need is for the Hamiltonian to be conjugated along the path in the way I want. So if I take a pair of anions, take the pull them apart, and uh, and and the Braid them together with this um, with this symmetry flux. That doesn't change anything to the Hamiltonian because taking an anion, pull them apart. That process commute with the low energy Hamiltonian. It doesn't create excitations, right? R right. I, I create a pair of anion. Nothing changes in the middle. Th they are deconfined anion exactly because of this property that they don't create excitations in the middle. Uh, in the middle, you don't even know that an anion has passed, and um, and you, you just you only see that uh, effect at the end point uh, around the anion. If you look in the middle, you don't even know that something happened. So this process of creating a pair of symmetry flux and pulling them apart is well defined only up to uh, the the addition of taking a pair of anion and then pulling them apart, right? So I can redefine. So I can redefine a symmetry flux by fusing it with with an anion of my choice. I can just take my favorite anion and uh, fuse it 
uh, with this symmetry flux. I can, I can fuse them and then pull them apart. And then the change to the Hamiltonian will be exactly the same if I didn't have this anion here. Because, I'm oh, sorry. A billion anion? Ah, yes, a billion. Yes, uh, yeah. A non abelian anion can do tricky things. They can change the topological sector after breaking. Yes, I associate whatever anion I want to each uh, flux. And this thing can be arbitrary. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to form a group structure or anything. It's just labeled by G1. It doesn't have, have to have anything to do with the group structure of G1. It's just whatever I want to attach to this symmetry flux. So for each symmetry flux, I can choose to redefine it by uh, attaching it to an anion. And because of this redefinition, uh, the A over there the A here will also get changed to So this is like the anti-anion of, uh, of uh, BG1, G2. OK, so I have arrived at the two important equations for this lecture. So if we want to talk about symmetry fractionalization patterns in general, we want to solve for these A's. And these, this is the consistency condition that the A's have to satisfy. And this is the redundancy telling you which A's are the same, which A's are not the same. And two A's that can be related in this way is just up to redefinition of the symmetry flux. They're not really different things. And if they're not related in this way, then they're different. So to answer someone's question, uh, these four are really different. Did someone ask this question? But uh, also, we can already see that by uh, see what kind of symmetry transformation these E and M and F quasi particles uh, have on the time order system. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So it, it's a matter of how the symmetry group acts on the anions, right? Because these are anion coefficients. Usually when we have U1, uh, phase factor, then time reversal acts on that because time reversal wants to do complex conjugation. But here, what you need to worry about is how the, sim uh, the symmetry acts on the anion, whether it permutes it or not. If it permutes the anion type, then it gets changed. So, so there's actually a, a G1 here. Yes. So this is uh, for, for people who know uh, this projective representation notation, this is H2 of G with A coefficient, where A is the set of annuals in the theory. Oh, you're totally right, yes. Yes, thank you. So A is a set of abelian annuals.
Um, right. So I um, I wanted to do a few more examples. I feel this is too abstract. This is too formal. So let me go back to examples and do a few examples. Okay. Examples. Um, let me. I I want to do both lattice models and also um, um, field theory models, but I may not have time to go into um, go go through all of them. But just just uh, whatever I can do. So let's let's just c go back to Tori code. Square lattice Tori code, not even hexagonal lattice. Uh, So if we have Hamiltonian like this, uh, z, 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 z. X, 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 x. So this is just some uh, examples that are particularly simple and um, illustrating of what kind of symmetry fractionization patterns um, uh, there can be. And I don't necessarily want to use the whole machinery I developed. That's a, that's a, that's a more, um, that's just for completeness and to show you the mathematical structure underlying this kind of thing. So, so this is Tori code on square lattice. And uh, this is obviously translation invariant. Right? And we can talk about how the quasi-particles transform under the translation symmetry. And uh, the E particle will be sitting on the lattice side, and the M particle will be sitting in the plaquette. And on the translation symmetry, they just move from vertex to vertex, plaquette to plaquette. Nothing obviously strange happens. Um, but then I want to do something funny. I want to flip the sign here. Okay. And if I flip the sign here, what happens? The Hamiltonian actually prefers to have flux in each plaquette, right? So uh, instead of penalizing having fl uh, flux, it wants to have flux. So we have n particle in all of the plaquettes. And then what happens to translation of the E particle? The E particle, when it moves in the square lattice, it will be moving in a background of uh, flux through each plaquette. So this is like uh, Leon talked about this morning, the magnetic translation symmetry um, of a particle. So you can imagine that this E is an electron. It moves in a background of magnetic field. It's just that we discretize that into a lattice so that through each plaquette, there is a pi flux. But the, what, what the pi flux does is that if you bring an E particle and let it go around the plaquette, then there's a minus one, right? This is just a Harnoff bomb effect that E going around M is minus one. Um, but, um, um, but this is also saying that translation symmetry now acts on the E particle in a funny way. Right? Of course, by changing this sign, I did nothing to the translation symmetry of the model. The model is still translation invariant. And you don't see any funny structure of translation symmetry just by looking at the Hamiltonian. But if you think about how the quasi-particle transforms, the, this E particle hop around here and uh, do translation x direction, y direction, minus x, minus y, and get a minus sign. So that's just saying that translation symmetry anti-commute uh, on an E quasi-particle. Okay. So this, this idea actually goes a long way. I think uh, Mike Hermili, not here anymore, <laughs> but he, wrote, uh, he, he, he generalized this idea to uh, a bunch of uh, situations where you can construct different uh, lattices and put magnetic flux in the places you want so that you can come up with models where uh, the E particle can transform in, in a fractional way. Okay, so if you're interested, you can talk to him. Um, another example involving Tori code and uh, translation symmetry is Shogun's version, not here either, <laughs> Shogun's version of, trans of Tori code. 
So in this version, the, the qubits are not on links, but instead on vertices. And the Hamiltonian term is a product of four poly matrices around each plaquette. And uh, it looks like um, x, z, z, x. So I'm using the quantum information notation just to get rid of the sigma. Um, okay. So you can check that um, all the terms commute for each term of every plaquette. And uh, this, is, this is equivalent to Tauri code. And the excitations are like this. So the excitations, well, of, they sit in each plaquette now. So this is one excitation, and it can be generated by applying sigma z here, sigma z here, sigma z here. So it goes diagonal like that. Okay. And the other excitation, the other excitation sits in a neighboring plaquette. And uh, and we can uh, make it by applying x here, x here, x here, and it goes this way. So these are, so these are both plaquette uh, excitations, but they are actually of different topological species. One co corresponds to the E particle, one corresponds to the M particle. And you can see that they, they have the expected braiding statistics because the string operator of one is composed of sigma z, the other one is composed of sigma x, and when they uh, commute, there's a minus sign. And that's all we need for this braiding statistic. But then we can see that under translation symmetry, we take one plaquette to another plaquette. So this is just saying translation symmetry will take e to m and m to e. So I said I won't talk about this kind of symmetry factorization, but this is just a, a, a very nice example. I can't help but talking about it. Yeah, that's time work. Yeah. This is translation. Yeah. So for translation, we for a long time know that this kind of thing can happen. Um, OK. So I wanted to show you more examples using uh, transcendent field theory, but I think I'll reserve that for uh, next time. Okay. Uh, right, this, this is for next <coughs> lecture. I'm getting behind schedule, but I think I'll be able to get there. Uh, that there are four possibilities here, right? And if you check using this, uh, this equivalence condition, you can see they're all different. And of course, we know they're different because the quasi-particles transform differently. And one of them is anomalous. That is uh, this one. And the, the point is that it's totally not obvious why this one's anomalous, why the other ones are not. Just by looking at the symmetry fractionalization pattern and looking at equations like this and looking at transformation laws like this, it's just uh, the anomalies in a symmetry fractionalization pattern is very hidden. Uh, you need to dig very hard in order to see that it's actually anomalous. Yeah. Huh? So does that mean that that condition will be violated? No. No. This is the consistency condition for any possible symmetry fractionalization pattern. So this has to be satisfied for anything that's possible even e either in 2D or on the surface of the 3D system. So, but when I say anomaly, I mean things that cannot happen in pure 2D system. It has to exist as a surface. So this kind of thing, when we talk about uh, and the, the uh, fractional, uh, the, and so this, this symmetry, uh, this consistency condition has to be satisfied in order for um, the pattern to be possible at all. And there's just uh, uh, no way to get away from it. If this condition is not satisfied, it's just saying you, you get something wrong. You shouldn't be looking at this at all. Uh, but once this is satisfied, there's still a possibility of anomalous fractionalization patterns. And to, to see that, we need extra tools. This is not enough. So we can apply this, let's say. So what people do is that um, 
uh, we, we can take um, Z2, uh, Z2 spin liquid, right? We can say, okay, let's assume now we have Z2 spin liquid on a Kagami lattice. And we have Z2 topological order with these kind of anions in the theory. And uh, we have time reversal symmetry, spin rotation symmetry, uh, all the lattice symmetries of, uh, of Kagami lattice. And we ask uh, what kind of um, symmetry fractionalization patterns there can be. And what you do is you solve this equation. Okay, you, you put the symmetry in here. You solve the equation, and you use that uh, con uh, the redundancy condition to get rid of redundancies. And then we arrive at a bunch of uh, symmetry fractionalization patterns. But then there's still this question of whether they are all possible in purely 2D models. Whether uh, I get a, a Heisenberg uh, Kagami lattice model, either nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor, or whatever interaction satisfying the symmetry, whether I can get the symmetry fractionalization pattern possible. Right. So there are things that's just impossible, whatever local interaction you have in 2D. That's a, that's a very strong statement. It's not even saying that I have uh, what, what's happening for the nearest neighbor uh, Heisenberg model. You can ask that question. That's a more practical question. This is a more general question of uh, whether we should be thinking about those kind of things at all, even though we, even though some kind of interaction may be more reasonable than others. Yeah. So. So okay. So the um, so there's um, a line of research going from here, like I mentioned, regarding spin liquid that I want to uh, comment a little bit now because I may not have time next time. I want to just talk about anomalies. So um, so, um, so, now we have this consistency condition. And uh, like I said, we can enumerate all possible ones. And then suppose we can um, detect anomalies. We can find all the, we can tell which ones are not anomalous, which ones are not. and um, um, and then we can separate the one, separate out the ones that's really c possible in two-dimensional models. And then the question is, which one is really realized in uh, in the material, right? And how do we see that? So for, to do that, we need either need a numerical method to tell, or we need experimental method to tell. So you can, uh, like uh, Donna talk about it, maybe Steve talk about it. Like uh, we can do numerical simulation using DMRG um, by putting a two-dimensional system on a cylinder and or or a, a stripe and simulate them as a one-dimensional chain. And um, uh, the goal is that by by putting this system on this cylinder type of geometry and doing something, we would be able to read out the symmetry fractionalization of these anions. And uh, then. Um, the nice picture that happens when you put a topological order on a on a cylinder is that um, we can imagine creating a pair of anions and bring them to the edge, so that the system in the bulk is still in the ground state. It's just some change of boundary condition. Sometimes it's just threading a flux through the system, but then the anions become the edge states of the one-dimensional chain, right? And then we can use different methods for DMRG, in, uh, like for studying even one-dimensional system, to tell what happens to the anions, because the anions now become the edge states. So this is, uh, this is a very powerful tool in numerics when people try to tell what symmetry fractionalization patterns uh, really happen in, let's say, um, uh, Kagami lattice Heisenberg model with nearest neighbor or next nearest neighbor interactions. And of course, experimentally, that's a different question. Uh, like, um, uh, how do we see? Uh, uh, we have already seen charge fractionalization, and we want to see, let's say, uh, spin charge separation. Or we want to see uh, things like this, that um, uh, anions moving uh, on the background of a flux, and there's a fractionalization of translation symmetry. So there are a bunch of work. Um, well, there, uh, there were uh, works already dating back in the days and also recently uh, on this uh, trying to propose experimental ways to see fractionalization. So that's beyond uh, what we can say for spin liquid today, that the thing doesn't order, it's not magnetic order, so it's a spin liquid. It's a more uh, concrete 
signature of fractionalization by looking at the, the quantum number. Yeah. Okay. All right, I, yes. You mean if there's a reason to believe that? Uh, sorry. Why is uh, it to okay, okay. So you're saying uh, so why is it equivalent to braiding of anions and why is it uh, equivalent to braiding abelian anions, right? Okay. So um, right. Um, I'm I mentioned why it's equivalent to mm, let me see it's equivalent to braiding anions because braiding anions don't actually do anything it if you braid an anion around the region if you braid an abelian anion around the region you get a phase factor but you get the same wave function that's and that's what we want because we know that the change of the Hamiltonian is the same. The change in the Hamiltonian in this braiding process, if we do G1 and G2 and then G1, G2, it's the same, right? So the ground state on both sides should be the same. The only difference is the phase factor accumulated in the adiabatic process. When the, when the ground state follow the Hamiltonian uh, uh, to the, the final state. And if we only want a phase factor on this state, then it better be um, braiding of anion, braiding of abelian anion, because braiding of non-abelian anion, it, cha it can change things. Yeah, it can change uh, super selection sectors or something. Yes. Sorry, what did you say? I'm saying the G can have a non-trivial action on A, but it can still be a split expansion. Uh, sorry, can you remind me what is a split? Uh, it's a direct oh, product. A -direct action. G has a non-trivial action. G has a non-trivial, then it's still a... Yes, the most trivial expansion. When it has an action on it, is it still... Uh, Extension? I don't yeah. think so. Um. Sorry? Right. Uh, so, of course, when, when the symmetry group acts on the anion, it's already, if it changes the anion type, that's already something right. non trivial. Yes. Um, oh, you are saying that even though G acts on A, there is still a version which is more trivial than others? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether it should be called that way. Uh, it already exchanges A, so... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it is a little bit weird. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, let's talk about that later. Sorry. All right. Uh, so the bosses will be right just south.